So, should we acknowledge that we've recorded this before? We can do if you want. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, okay, let's let's okay. I'll, I I might mention it in the intro, but let's let's just say for for the full disclosure, and I right. can edit it out if it doesn't sure. need to be in. So, for full disclosure, we did do one of these. Yeah. And who? Well, I, I don't know how you're looking at this, but I'm looking at it as you're kind of taking a directorial role on this yeah, podcast I've, in a way. You've sort of you've sort of I've thought about how two. it went. Yeah. I didn't actually listen to it, but I, I thought when we did, I just knew. Like the way you said, send me a proof copy, and you just went, nah, I'm not listening to that crap. Because I, I was thinking about it as you sent it, and I just thought, we've spent the interview, I was, it was the end of the day, I didn't really think about what was wanted here. And from my memory, we spent most of the interview of me just sort of being just blurry and ambivalent about <laughs> stand-up and or bringing all of my issues inappropriately to the, to the table. Um, and actually, when I thought about it, I thought this is actually quite an interesting. Your podcast sounds quite interesting because we, you know, <laughs> when, no, but in the sense that you say you say ask the industry. I mean, obviously, I do remember thinking it very funny that I'm the industry and took the piss out of that constantly last yeah. time we spoke. But um, I might do that again this time. You do that off mic as well. Like whenever we do it, you're just like, I, I don't right. know why you want to talk to me. I like the fact that <laughs> for this next hour, I am the industry. Yeah. <laughs> Just massage your ego. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but th- this question about what are comedians doing with directors is actually a question that you get asked a lot. And it is a thing that people are interested in because they because you go, what role does a director have with a stand-up? Especially because stand-up comedy seems to, you know, it lays a particular claim to being credible and authentic and raw and personal. You know, of all the dramatic forms it is the most quote unquote apparently authentic Mm. and so the notion that that's been somehow spun or um calculated in any way that there might be some kind of conspiracy (laughs) involved you know it's like (laughs) i've never used the word conspiracy (laughs) it's like the way it's you know it's like when i found out that lee harvey oswald wasn't the lone gunman it's just like the scales fell from my eyes right we need to move away from that (laughs) i'm writing a show at the moment called simon k knows who killed jfk (laughs) and we really need to move away from it simon was it was it simon Simon knows what it's called simon k knows who killed jfk oh goodness me i'm very interested in Uh, it we can talk about it after well yeah yeah yeah. i've just have you did you read the book by lamar waldron the last one where he where he basically talks about the testimony that was given to Traficante right. and I have that on my Kindle, but I've just but I've just <laughs> finished. Really good. Have you read the Warren the Report? History. I've just, yes. I've, just, oh, not, I've never read the, I've whole read the whole thing. I've read the whole thing. In the search for the show, I've read the entire Warren Report, and I swear to God, I am fixated on the Umbrella Man. Right. I am over the moon about the alien theory. I have I have gone so deep into it. I've got I've got an idea in the show about how I'm going to make a theory that I did it. Why? And I'm going to try and <laughs> and I'm going to try and write a thing about but how someone the, thinks I'm a time traveller and I've done this to but silence the truth by throwing well, everyone off. Cl- you've clearly yeah. gone down the rabbit hole. I've gone hole. too far down the rabbit but, hole. But, which is Do you want to direct this one? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to... Honestly, it's fucking off the check. Back I, you out. The girl I'm seeing at the moment literally keeps saying... Well, I'm sure she'll be very comforted with that description you too. You can't... Well, all right. We haven't discussed... All right, I'll change it. But my girlfriend, there we go. Thank you. She... Well, we haven't discussed it. I feel it. better. We haven't discussed it and I don't like calling someone a girlfriend because it's a weird statement. Right. I like... I, Strictly speaking, you're seeing me right now. That's true. That's so true. I'm feeling a little hurt. I'm sorry, mate. Um, but basically, she has banned me from talking about JFK or any <laughs> any conspiracy stuff. Talking right. about anal probing from um, what uh, does that have to do with the Kennedy assassination? Because there was an alien. Where theory. was that in Dealey there Plaza? Was, there was an alien theory about him being abducted by aliens, oh, and they I replaced see. him with a with a dummy, like a hollowed out shell of a human. And that's right, why there was never an which autopsy. they then killed because Johnson took over. That makes no, no sense. But there was never an autopsy. Like there was never an autopsy right. report. So they were saying that they just saw it. That it was an alien. This is a weird start to this podcast. <laughs> It's going to be such a weird... Let's we do an edit point. record this in a month. Yeah, let's edit point I think this is funny. Anyway. No, I like right. it, but it's, it's, it's getting me back into an anyway, area right, that people not, don't like me talking about let's because not I talk, go down the rabbit hole let, fast. Let's not... Okay, let, let's not talk about yeah. Okay, But I do think it is a really interesting subject. And it I is. think in... You know, if you have a moderate and rational mind, it's really interesting. I have, here's the thing, right? I have a very <laughs> rational mind. I'm sure you but, do. Um, but in the show, yeah. and I keep taking on this character in real life, I'm playing the part of a conspiracy. Like the, the, oh, the I set. See. Oh, you, oh, it's a part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The set, oh, the set is set up like a bed set, and the idea is the audience have come in, oh, okay, and right. they're trying to check in on me because I haven't come out of the house for months. <laughs> so, so the idea right. is, so it's kind of a silly show where they've come to check in on me, right. and I immediately go, I'm glad you're here because I've got something to tell you. Right, okay. And, and I sort of go off on one. And, right. and they just have to sit through it essentially um 
It's a, it, we'll talk about it afterwards because I'd, I'd be interested to know why you are so interested in it. Uh, Hello and welcome to the Ask the Industry podcast, episode 99. I'm comedian Simon Kane, and this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio and today, directing. That little bit of banter you just heard was me talking to John Gordillo. We have got slightly sidetracked at the start of our recording, talking about JFK and all the conspiracies around it. It was uh, enlightening, to say the least, and exciting to talk to someone else who is just as fixated on it as I am. I did, however, edit a lot of it off, so that is the last bit you're going to hear about it. I am tempted to release the full 20-25 minutes uh, as a little extra for the patrons so if you are a patron keep your eye out for that uh, and if you're not a patron sign up because uh, it is fucking off the chain the reason i cut it where it was is because john was just getting into asking me why the jfk assassination is the subject that i would like to write about for a show i should say that the show isn't my 2018 show so if you're expecting to come to see me in edinburgh or any point around the country at the moment uh that's not the show you're going to see unless it is labelled JFK. Like, if JFK's in the title, that's the show. Just don't get them confused, because I don't want anyone coming and being disappointed. But the interesting part for me was how he keeps asking the why. Why does that interest you? Why is that attracting you? Why is that idea so interesting to you? Which is uh, something I really relate to. In, in life, generally, for me, why someone's doing something is way more important than what they're actually doing. And it was a great chat to get involved with with him, but it also led us into a lot of stuff to do with his directing. Now, John is known as the Oracle of Directing. He has worked with comedians like Sean Walsh, Josh Widdicombe, Shappi Gorosandi, Dara O'Brien, Michael McIntyre, Reginald D. Hunter, just to name a few. He's worked with people at all levels of the industry and at the moment he's currently working with anyone who would like to work with him. It, it's kind of a, a weird thing we get into it in the podcast but essentially at the Bill Murray Angel Comedy he is doing sessions with people at any level of comedy to see if they can work together, to see if he can offer something and offer some sort of value for the work that you're producing as he wants to find new talent. He wants to work with new and exciting voices. So there'll be a link for that in the podcast notes if you think you'd like to work with him or you think you'd like to book a session to try and work with him. That's definitely worth looking into as they are limited and I've done one and I found it really interesting. I found it honestly so fascinating and exciting to do that I can't recommend it more highly enough. In case you need any more information about him, he's, there'll be a link to his website and his Twitter and all those things inside the show notes as well. He's directed live tours, DVDs, TV shows, and now he's working on his first feature film. And we cover the role of the director in comedy, his interest in directing, and his lack of interest in performing, and the way he sees the collaborative process. I think loads of people will get loads out of this, and I think it's a really great episode 99. We're so close to episode 100. It feels so weird to say that but i'm so excited so uh thank you very much for listening I won't, I won't be too soppy about this because i've got i'm gonna do like a little thing for episode 100 but if you have been listening for, for a lot of episodes i can't thank you enough i can't thank you enough for your support and everything else here are some quick ways you can support me if you haven't already if you're new here please do hit the subscribe button if you're old here please do remember to give it an honest ideally positive review in itunes and either way please do join the Facebook group. It's called the Ask the Industry Podcast, and it's on Facebook, obviously. But for now, without any more delays, this is John Gordillo. Anyway, so directing. Um, <laughs> as we said, we've done this one before. Not this conversation about JFK. We've done a podcast before, mm. and you were not fully satisfied with your answers. Yeah, I just thought, I, yeah, I just didn't think, I didn't, think about what I would I didn't think about directing because what's happened enough because what's happened recently is that my work's changed a bit I, I'm not doing stand-up at the moment and sort of increasingly over the right years of, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, and increasingly I've sort of found myself yeah I mean uh, directing acts also directing other things um, uh, doing theatre, doing television, and the thing that I've spoken about for just years is making a film. And so I'm now casting it, and I'm going to shoot it next year. And that's been a thing that's been a thing that's just gone on with me forever. And so I've definitely moved more into that line of thing. Um, and also have just become a bit less satisfied with myself as a stand-up and less interested. And I said I'm quite on, I'm quite on off. I have periods where I'm really interested in it and periods where I'm just sick of myself. And I definitely hit one of those periods. 
Um, and also, yeah, you know, whatever, just I've got a young family and have reasons just and need to be close to home. So what's been happening is just in the last couple of months, I've been we, we record this at the we're recording this at the Bill Murray, the pub, the comedy club in Islington. And I've been seeing people. They've advertised it. Um, so people come in and talk to me. I mean, literally every level of the business. I'm talking with from very top to very bottom. Um, and they've advertised it as a kind of comedy surgery. So I'm like a doctor. And I love that. <laughs> I'm aware of how prickish that sounds. But I really love it. actually helps my thinking. I get to sit for a couple of hours with people. I mean, obviously, if we're, in certain cases, we're involved in doing kind of ongoing work and developing their act or developing a show. But a lot of times, people will just come in and it's like a surgery. And they'll brain dump. They'll describe where they're at, what they want to do in terms of stand-up. Um, and they're just asking questions. How can I get it funnier? How can I get it, you know, more expressive? How can I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you get to make a diagnosis. <laughs> and it's great. I, I really enjoy that about it. it, it, it and it you listen really closely to them and make a decision and then see, you know, if, if is there any value in treating them, as it were, yeah. um, or in, in meeting again to talk about it. Cause, because cause not with, you don't always necessarily have a, a, a creatively fruitful conversation with everybody where you feel, I, I could really help feed you. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. In the last couple of months then, I've been um, just observing and listening to stand-up comics and writers at pretty much every stage of development. And yeah, it, it's really, so as far as that question, when people ask, well, what exactly is it that a director does for a stand-up? Um, it turns out I can answer that. <laughs> well, um, Cause you previously, when I, when I first came into contact with mm. your work, you were being called the professor. And I know you. Do. I don't think anybody called me the professor apart from Stuart the, apart from Stuart. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I, I'd I never heard that yeah, before yeah. he said that. Although he, I think he mentioned to me that a few other people call you it, but you're not particularly happy with that as a as a. Oh, it's meaningless. I don't care. Actually. But you like what? doctor better. <laughs> <laughs> I see your point. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I like neither doctor nor professor. No, I just it's quite a fun way of thinking about it because normally when you're directing someone, you're involved in really ongoing work, and yeah, you're sort of marshalling something through. And this isn't quite that. This is a bit like what I found out in theatre recently, and apparently this is a standard thing. I didn't know. It sounded pretentious to me. Um, they have these things called dramaturgs. And a dramaturg is a person who literally has no responsibility for anything, but just sits in. You come and talk to him or her about your script and your production or wherever you are, and they just slag it off or not uh, and give you pointers on how to do it better. And that sounds to me like the easiest job in the world. And it's theatre, so it's not even like you, your advice has to be good. Um, and so... <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> you don't know some theatre people listen to. <laughs> I'm joking. I know, I know. Um, I, I, so, but, so, but in, in, it, there is a, a chunk of what I'm doing at the moment that is actually a bit like that. It's just listening to, yeah, just doing that and offering arm's length advice. Well, okay, okay. Um, let's, let's just start back yeah. a step and go from here so uh, say well, I'm a comedian let's let's go from here I've never worked with a director before why would I need one so there's this sort of three categories of people I've worked out that I see coming do, doing this about a third of the people I see are people who are looking to find their voice they're trying to figure out who they are and that work is quite fundamental I mean also it it also applies to people who have somewhat established but are looking to deepen what they do or don't feel they're firing on all cylinders. And so there's that. So if you're not feeling that your persona is necessarily in place or that you're free in the way you need to be just to sort of bounce through your set and, you know, not have it be like a total intellectual in your head experience, um, then, you know, that kind of work. Then there are people who are looking to develop longer work uh, they're looking to do an Edinburgh show or they've got a set that they like but they feel it needs structuring that you need to find some heart in it and in there that's the yeah, that's more involved that's more ongoing work that's where you help people really find the heart of what it is they're on about and again sometimes though it can lead to persona work in that you're making statements about yourself so I think people need a director when they're looking for someone a director will give you coherence, connections, 
find ways of helping you connect it and get you to somewhere that's bigger than and deeper and perhaps more satisfying and more human. It's as much about who you are in between the jokes as when you tell the jokes. Yeah, I understand, I understand what you mean. Yeah. It's, it's like uh, you can be as self-aware as you think you are. Like Anyone can be really self-aware, but ultimately you'll never be able to judge yourself at the same level as an outsider person. Exactly, yes. Exactly what you said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was. Um, well, no, okay, so, so, uh, so th those are the three types of people you deal with. A, yeah, a, and from and from those, I mean, yeah, it tends to be, yeah, and it's quite interesting, like what you find yourself listening for and what you find yourself going for, because when you're, there's such a gap between, often between people's sets, which can be quite pedestrian, and then how they are in the room when they're talking to you, when they're just alive and interesting and unexpected and funny, and very often I sort of find myself kind of going, oh, how can we get that onto stage? How can you? Get get rid of the boundaries that of the you know the the self imposed or imposed by other those sort of pillars that are there that say oh this is what a stand up comedian has to sound like and this is what it is and I'll open with a bit about this and do that and say ah come on all of that stuff is the enemy of comedy it's not funny and there's a real limit to how far that gets you um, just you know that school of comedy that points out the most as there is I mean schools it just seems to be really common advice where you see people coming out of stand-up courses making the most obvious jokes about either their ethnicity or their size or their whatever that is at their alleged USP and missing just how glorious and nuanced and just fun and alive they are when you're in a room them talking to them. I've, I've had a couple of people lately. I used to think that some of these, I think stand-up courses are good in the sense that they help people express themselves and if they teach you how to write jokes and to remember to put the funny word at the end all of that's good but I don't know that anything else about them is valuable in the sense that I think that the advice I've had a couple of experiences recently where people have told me advice that they've gotten there's one person that I saw recently who is European is from a non is from non-England and uh, and is overweight and those are the least interesting things about this person. <laughs> but this is where the advice has been to do their act, to, to focus it on being from this particular European country and being overweight and have that be the filter that life gets passed through. And meanwhile, this person sitting in the room telling me really fascinating, vivid, potentially hilarious stories about their confused sexuality, how they come from a weirdly liberal but fucked up background that is austere and of this country and how they are the most normal person in this family and yet the one who is treated like the weirdest and whatever this person just told me this really fascinating very funny very messed up story and and I'm going you should do that that's just get us into that and then this person telling me, well, you know, I was advised that this was, nobody would be able to relate to it. But I was advised to do jokes about being from this European country and fat. And this, this sent me apoplectic because you go, ah, you know, the notion that just because somebody has a unique but slightly hard to explain but will take you just 10 seconds more to give the information so you can get us into a genuinely specific and um, defined view of the world. The notion that, that people won't be able to relate to that, that person's story is all about feeling rejected by your family, feeling jealous of your siblings, feeling all the things that everybody feels or understands. It's completely universal and it's utterly unique because it's come out of that person's life. And to hear that, that you know, the, the kind of advice, oh no, don't, don't touch that, nobody wants mm. to hear about that. That's exactly what people want to hear about. Mm. It, it, you, the, the job is to lead the audience by the hand to that and that is prop really properly funny because the other thing ain't going anywhere because everyone's doing the other thing mm. I think the last time we spoke I told you about a gig I did with uh, and I won't name who they are but a very yeah we're being very careful in this conversation about yeah. not naming people <laughs> you, you do know that everyone's playing Guess Who in the background of this right, going, sure. I bet I know that one yeah. but no I, I did a gig with a very high up name who went off script <laughs> and they um they start oh, I know talking, this story. You tell yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah, start yeah, talking on. about how they get really anxious when they've got to do TV work yes. and stuff. 
and I was sitting there going, yes. And it was the first time in their set, because I'd seen their set a load of times, and I was like, oh, this is, I know where it's going, I'm a bit bored by it, because yeah. you, you are after hearing it a certain number sure. of times. And then I was like, where's this going? This sounds interesting. I've never, you very rarely hear someone who's done panel shows and things talk about being anxious on panel shows. And, they, and then they just stopped and they came off, and I was like, what, what happened? And they were like, no, right. I don't want to talk about it. And I was like, please talk about right. it. And I get what you mean. It's um, it's it's uh, overlooking. It, it's it's I suppose stopping too early with an idea, which Absolutely. is something that you Absolutely. or exploring it only in its most superficial sense. I mean, uh, uh, advice that I tend that I find myself giving quite a lot, and it, you would think that it leads perhaps only into one kind of comedy, but it doesn't. Um, it's about specifying or working out what you really feel about something, or especially how you are complicit in the problem. Pulling the rug out from under yourself, giving, but being able to identify if it's in anger or in discomfort or whatever it is, exactly what it is. Find language for exactly what it is that is fucking you up about the thing. And think about that, think about the opposite, think around it, think, feel your way around it, look at all the different nuances, because that gives you loads to talk about first of all this it gives you loads of ways of attacking it yeah it's about it's not so much about pushing the idea as opposed to if you can really identify and if you can really identify and specify what it where you stand in relation to this idea what it is about it that attracts you or messes you up you will naturally find ways of extending that idea because what you're really doing when you're looking at an idea is you're exploring your many reactions to it or the many tones that you have which means um, that you have to be quite self-aware. You have to be very aware of your own absurdity and your own stupidity and your own emotions because you have to be able to somewhat separate from that in order to play with it because that's the quality that binds all your stuff together. It's just that sense of play and fun. But anyway, I think it's about, I think it's about looking at how you feel just because ex- from there, that's what tends to make me, if I'm pissed off about something, it tends to make me want to find ways of vocalizing it, get the emotion out, try to figure out what the words are, why am I having this reaction to it? And I think, yeah, anyway, that, that's, that's the fun. And the further, you, the more specific you get with everybody, the more interesting they get. Mm. And it's just, that's a universal. Definitely. And the more original and the more intimate and the mm. more connected and the more surprising. And that's what you want. And that's mm. comedy. That's what comedy is anyway. Yeah, totally. Well, let's, um, let's quickly knock out the, the, the basic questions and then we can get deep into the ideas. <laughs> the questions that pretty much everyone's going to be asking mm-hmm. listening to this. Mm-hmm. Where, uh, okay, so you said you see people at all levels. When ideally should someone come to see a director? I don't know. That's, th- th- it all depends what you want. <clears throat> if you don't know what you want, I can't help you. But if you know that you're looking to find your voice, you know you're looking to progress to 20 minutes, or you know you're trying to go from being, you know, to, you want to make a narrative-based show, for example, then I can help you. My feeling has been probably it helps if you've at least got a few gigs under your belts because you can at least process what it, the, the sensory thing of coming off stage and figuring out how just all of that affects you and how that affects your writing, just, just, just to get a bit of bone sense about it. But having said that, somebody came to see me who'd barely been on stage at all and it was really rewarding in terms of yeah, just in terms of trying to identify the essence of someone and why someone's potentially funny and what they could take on stage with. So no, I, I don't know that there is any I- ideal time. The only question is, is can this director help you? Because there are a bunch of people doing this and they, I guess they will have different skills and offer different advice. Hmm. How do you direct someone without taking over their idea? Uh, because, w- well... If I do take over their idea, i.e. I think I have a better way of expressing it, or I want them to go, have you thought about looking at it this way? Because this is how I would think about it. The only thing I can say is, I'm not taking over your idea, this is just my thought. And you need to go away and listen to the recording of this and decide whether you want to do that. It's up to them. If they want to go with, fine. But it, but I don't, I, I, I'm in no danger of taking over people's ideas because the way I work is, is with stand-up, it has to be... It has to, they are the author. They may need someone to help tell them or to shape the mess of their ideas. And they may need someone to tell their story for them, but they have to tell it. And I don't, and so I think everything you do, in the same way that when you're working with an actor, you know, you have to make this in an idiom, in a style that the actor has to convincingly be able to tell if they can't say your words. So, 
And they're not really saying your words in stand-up. They're only sometimes saying your words. They're, they're generally, it's about, most of the work is about trying to help them find their way of saying their words. And so there's a point at which there are sometimes, I could give ideas, but I don't. You know, you've got, this is your, the matter what I want to do, it matters what you make of it. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that's my answer. When you're directing someone, do you ever feel like a level of responsibility for how well the show gets reviewed or awarded or you know if, you, if you've worked with a person last year and they got an award for a show and then this year they don't is there ever like a feeling of you know accountability from your end of that or are you I, if i'm very embedded in the show i feel like i've made a i made a, a couple of stand-up shows last year that I was very embedded in like it really had a lot of my thinking and my ideas and i was very invested in whether that went well or not and i felt personally gratified and would have felt personally sad if it had sad I mean I would have felt you know kicked or whatever you feel rejected if it hadn't gone well and I made a theatre show last year which I was very involved in the writing and that I think had that not gone well I think I would have taken that a bit personally too but that's the responsibility that I feel because no the 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 and that's that that's when I feel I've got some authorship or ownership over the over the piece but most of the time I'm working as a sort of a glorified consultant or script editor. I want things to go well, but I'm, you know, I'm quite comfortable with the ethics of how I do it. Like I, I don't need to express myself through other people's work. Um, I've got enough, I've got my own work I can do that with. So it is, what's very enjoyable, it's, a, it's convenience for me. So I don't feel that I need to, so I don't feel particularly responsible for someone's show if, uh, if, I don't, oh, you've got me thinking. There's a couple I've thought of. I've kind of thought, well, I would have felt responsible if that had not gone well for them because I definitely steered them in that direction. I just don't do it and pull the wool over people's eyes. You know, people are allowed to say no and excuse me, this is not right. And I'm always looking for that. I just, I'm not the author. You know, if I'm the author, it's a different story. So it doesn't sound like there's a particular style that you wouldn't be able to direct because it's you helping them express an idea up to a point you have to be able to you have to be able, I mean as I often say if somebody like a Milton Jones or a Tim Vine or someone who was just a real joke smith came to me um, unless they're looking to push that into, into a new world or do something different with their persona i.e. tell a different story somehow through it I don't know how to help those people I mean you just have to be able to match them it, it seems to me at being able to write jokes and I'm I'm a slow joke writer. Somebody, you know, I mean, I, again, depends who I'm with. If I'm in the room and I can feel the idiom of what they're doing, I'll give loads of jokes. It's, you know, it's like anybody. It's like it's in the click that you have with the person or the material. Um, but there are, I, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, there are some people, the people I wouldn't help, be able to help, are the people I don't have an instinctive click with. And I think that goes above and beyond genre. I think I'm just fortunate in this in in this moment in that I'm working in the mainstream of stand up the mainstream of stand up is observational confessional reality based stand up and even though I really love characters and like pushing people into crazy characters and into surrealism it has to be grounded in reality there has to be a connection to the real world so yeah no I feel quite confident about helping people either tell themselves or tell stories what I find interesting about that is, so when I said it like that, in my head, I was thinking, so as far as I know, I don't know your fallback catalogue of stand-up, but as far as I know, you've not done like an arena tour or something like no. that. <laughs> but you have directed... I think we would all know if I'd done an arena no, but, tour. But, but my point is, you have, you have directed shows yeah. for arena comedians. Sure, yeah. yeah. So, and, and obviously, if you're doing a, 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 you know, we're in the 15-seater upstairs in the Bill yeah. Murray, if you're doing this space, as yeah. opposed to, say, a 500-seater theatre, yeah. you're producing a different bit of work than, than you might be for an arena, for example. And so my take on it was, is there ever a point where you go, I don't, I, I've not done this, so I can't do it, or is it? No, it def if the differences wouldn't be at that level. I don't really think there's very much difference at all. Um, and and I, that's why you see the big arena comics will practice their stuff in 50 seat rooms uh, when they have to, uh, I think it's the same. Those are issues to do with rhythm and pacing, but you're still telling a story of yourself or about yourself even if you're not telling a narrative you're still telling a story about who you are and where you're at um i don't think no and i i don't think for me the scale of projects or even i mean i wouldn't be able to know how to direct an opera because i don't have a feeling for opera or ballet um but i'd happily you know but I, there's not much else would bother me because it's just storytelling 
as long as you as long as you have a sense of what the the tools are and the thing in stand up is you are working with a very limited set of tools as a director you're essentially using the performer and then you know this shows that you get embedded in as a director like the the one I did just now with Phil Nickel um that so you're wrong you're wrong yep that then became a sort of a very from being a very involved job of script editing into being show direction when you start going okay this element this Jimi Hendrix song has to come in here and it has to we have to float out of it into this bit of story and we have to have that feeling those are specific fussy directorial calls about detail um and that to me is directing like that's why the writing is directing because those details are in the writing and how you choose to sequence or order a story so yeah it's all about details but yeah you get into their net elements of presentation but with the medium as long as you know as long as you understand the medium you're working in all stories are the same i think and that that means i think i believe even though the logistics are different it's the same as making a fringe theater show is is directing a 200 million dollar movie the the structures may be slightly different but the goal of it is the same it's not you know the lo- the logistics are different but there's nothing inherently intimidating about either form I don't think. Okay. They're the same is what I'm saying. Okay, so when I've never directed a 200 million dollar movie. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> that's the that's your cap. So if anyone's Oops, listening, I just realized what I said. <laughs> if anyone's listening and they're like, "Oh, I've got this 200 million dollar movie, right. <laughs> but I do need a director." I don't think for good no, no. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go with Simon because clearly yeah. <laughs> he'll ask all the right questions. Um, okay, so what when when say you're working with someone for the first time mm. who has never worked with a director, mm. are there any misconceptions? about what you actually do that they come with or that people frequently come with? People don't know what it is. I mean, people just kind of go, do, do I need to bring material? Do I need to prepare anything? Yeah, I asked you that. And, yeah. and, I, and I go, it's up to you. I mean, I take a very simple, I say just brain dump, whatever it is. I say all roads lead to Rome. I, if you come in and you want to do a little bit of your show for me, I'll sit down and I'll just be listening to you and looking at you as it, I'm just looking for who you are in between the jokes. I'm just looking for where the fun in you is, where the spirit, the, the, the play, the, the vulnerability, the, the, the thing about you that's a bit wrong or that doesn't quite fit into the adult world or that is slightly at odds or the child. Like, what is the spirit? What is the fucking funny thing about you that is, what is the sweet thing about you? What is the thing that draws me to you and makes me like you? Because I have to like you. I can't laugh at you unless I like you. And that, in, in itself is a thing that shouldn't be corrupted because, you know, you can't make someone like you. You've just got to be likable. You've got to allow the audience to like you. And so I hate, again, the, this, obviously this sort of school of comedy where, where people make themselves likable. So I'm trying to think, uh, 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 comedians are very, we're, we're like spin doctors. We're very political. We understand very well what, because our audience, we're right up against the sensitivities of the age. You know, our audience, our audiences are our regulators. They're our contact with normality. They're our contact with a sort of socially received, agreed sanity. And we have, and that's, we have to be able to make contact with that before we work. We can be nuts. The audience doesn't necessarily want to stay in an inhibited or conventional place. The audience wants to think differently. That's why they come to stand up in part. So they're up for the journey, but we all have to know that everything's okay. We have to know that we're in the real world and that this is a joke. And then you can say what you want. And as long as you let reality know that you're, you know there's something wrong with you or there's something odd about you, um, then you can be transgressive. And that's when we start laughing, when you start breaking code. But, but anyway... So what I'm interested in when I listen to somebody or watch somebody come in, I'm looking for the thing about them that's wrong, that's, that doesn't <laughs> quite, and I, don't, and I don't mean like in a fuck you wrong, just that's yeah, to, yeah. I, mean, I just mean like that's just slightly broken or off or weird or silly or extreme or too much or not quite integrated into society. What is that thing that is a spirit that makes you kind of go, ah, Yes, you're fun. I like you. You're funny. You're you're not bound by my rules, um, and then I think the challenge is to kind of go. And then the, the challenge is: a Are you right, or does this person coming in with something else that they do much better? Usually not. Usually it's their spirit they're trying to seek. 
do they agree with you that this is the thing about them that you like and they should amplify that and we should play with that and we should improvise with it and see what happens and try and write some material for it? And, and how to tell that to, to the quote-unquote sane world, to the, to the sane audience, to the police, to the people who are here who need, first of all, to judge that you're okay. To, that we want you to be wrong, but we need you to know that you know you're wrong. We need you to know that because we've all seen comics who are too loopy or too angry and we don't feel safe to laugh. You know, we have to, you know, this comedy is weird. It's a safe space. Everything's got to be just peachy and sweet and not threatening before we can start getting into the threatening stuff. Um, so it's that. It's trying to figure out how do you tell the story of this weird, funny character, spirit, persona thing? How do you produce that and bring that out? How do you let the audience know that the person knows what they're doing, which in, it, which in the performance case requires tremendous self-awareness? To be aware of your own absurdity, to not mind that weakness that we spend so much time covering up in our normal lives, in our socialized lives. How to let that out and not mind and know that it's okay. You know, that requires a certain, this is one of the reasons I think why comedians tend to be very self-aware and very, you know, connected to their responses because you need that again you need that to be able to rinse a subject and to know that you haven't just got one reaction you've got eight to it and you need to look at all of those eight reactions and bring them all out in some flow so so yeah it's a combination <laughs> it's a long answer but it is about from my point of view yeah it's about I think as a comic I think you're either sane or insane you're either adult or child you either speak about your childishness, you share your insanity from the point of view of being a sane adult so you can explore your craziness, or you are a nutty child, you know, who comes on and just fizzes about. But even the nutty child has to acknowledge to the audience, I know this isn't right. I know I should be doing something else. I know this isn't the way to be, because otherwise we, we need to know that, it's a, that you know, and then we can laugh. So it's a question of managing all of that trying to figure out what's fun about you, what point of view you're telling it from, are you really nuts or are you someone who's sharing your nuttiness? And how do we tell all of that? How do, we just, how do you get that into just two lines and be done with it and go on, we're telling jokes. <clears throat> um, and of course the people who are good at this, are there is a fundamental sanity in their work because they, all of that is acknowledged. We know, you know, um, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, Tim Vine is totally sane. Um, I, I, I wrote down a nutty... Spencer Jones is an act who keeps drawing reference to... He knows. He, he knows he's wrong. He literally does. Like, some, yeah. some characters don't do it as... With Spencer, I've seen him go, I'm 42. Yeah, exactly. Like, he'll I've literally, got a mortgage. Yeah, I've yeah. got a kill, whatever, yeah. And, I, and I, I don't know what it is, but when I see him do it, it's not... It feels very right, and it doesn't feel cheap mm. or any kind of like you know whatever. Mm. But I've seen comedians do that sort of mm. um, like as in non. I don't think is Spencer. A I don't know if he is a character. I, you know, he obviously is an extension, but I don't think of him as a character. I think of him as just like a, a sort of clowning mm -hmm. type comedian. Do you know what I mean? To me, that's not a character. To me, everyone's a character on stage. Even even when if you're a non-character act, I think you're playing a character in the very act of selection, that and amplification, that is involved when you develop a persona or, or lift yourself up into that sort of playful space, I think you're being a character. I, t I understand. It's about amplifying and being aware of your own absurdity um, or not, or just doing something else, but just, or just being aware that you're not doing that. Just because you, you know, I mean, it absolutely isn't necessarily about bringing your direct experiences to stage. You can, you can totally ignore them. But even, you know, even when you're doing that, like you've got an act like, say, James Acaster, who... Uh, yeah, I mean, Acast is brilliant to me because he does, um, Acast does, there's a lot of sanity in Acast's act because on the one hand, he's, he's playing the part of a really sort of petty, defensive, self-deceiving character who takes false pride in non-achievements and struts around making self-important observations about things that are insignificant. 
so there's all of that and he does that in a super absorbing charismatic way and he's just such a fun spirit he's his spike is really really good so at one level just at the level of just craft and fun he's just great but what i think is brilliant about him is that there's this other sense that creeps up through his shows that is really sane it's a real sane perspective on his behavior where there's this sort of acute feeling of melancholy and loss and regret that builds up that that reset show where he's a guy who keeps telling you how he's completely satisfied with his choices but he can't stop thinking about what could happen if you could go back and reset the clock and he clearly can't stand himself and he clearly can't live with a single decision he's ever taken and he ends up being crushed under the weight of it in that leaning tower of pisa bit and there's just some other arc that goes on under him where these funny silly observations underneath you feel there's another intelligence guiding it that's going here is a portrait of someone who is at war with himself or who is in disconnected from himself and is therefore alone and lost and partial and not quite a person and it's comedy and it's gentle it's just a little snapshot of someone but it gives you an extraordinary other perspective a sane real world perspective on this mad little character that 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 he's playing and for me that is great that is it's what yeah it just allows this thing that in another way could be for me i would appreciate it because i like him i find him warm so i like him as a performer so i'm into him but otherwise i might think yeah his stuff is kind of cute but yeah whatever all the rest of it but then there's this other thing going on where it's really meditative now whether that's him having thought that through at that level or trying to make emotionally resonant work or, or being aware of that he's activating aspects of his personality or displacing his pain there was a show he made like 2 years ago where he i knew he had been through a breakup and had had a very tough time with it and that is not something that he would express directly in his work but it's sort of indirectly sort of bubbled up into the character and into the scenario of of the show that he was making whether that's him a uh, uh, a performer or an artist working through their issues and putting them into their work i'm not sure that it is actually i think it's it's more likely somebody just using those feelings and recognizing that there's an electricity or an energy there and putting them into the work and that way because that's what you're into because i don't think this work can ever actually be therapy I think you've got to have dealt with it or be somewhat separate from it in order to process it. But anyway, I find that connection. Anyway, all I'm saying is like I don't know what I'm talking about now, but I think <laughs> but what I'm saying is I think his work is really sane and I think he processes and is aware of his of quite a range of his emotions and feelings and he processes them and puts them into his work in an intelligent and really uh interesting way that gives it depth. But he's not a guy who you know an act who bears his soul and who is you know a confessional literal prosaic stand up i i think from that what i've taken is that you analyze really well and <laughs> the, the um you overthink I'm, like I'm i do. um but also uh, fellow addict <laughs> yeah yeah but also um when you're so so this is going to sound I, correct me if i'm wrong on Go this because i'm more than happy to be wrong when i'm watching a show like an edinburgh or or whatever what i remember most is aside from the ending generally speaking is moments in the show yeah. between jokes where someone was so themselves and so honest with the audience that i i don't even remember the joke either side i just remember yeah. a line remember, yeah. or a, or a moment or whatever something crystallized something yeah. gelled and something broke through and it's and it's usually something really small it's usually uh, in in my last show I, the last time i did it I have a line in it where I say I I I'm stuck in a routine and routines make me happy and routines make me feel safe and I and I carried on and then I went into a joke about a routine and someone came up to me afterwards and went that's me like they didn't need, they didn't even comment yeah, on right. the joke but they obviously you know would have listened but that's to it. what that's but, it's, but that's what it is isn't it it's that mm. moment of identification when something that you feel when something speaks to you and you feel that it's either about you or you can so easily slot into it yeah. and often those moments even happen in a weird way they're the moments that get you laughs at gigs where you're not going very well where you just decide to be real and call it and activate and bring in 
your feelings of discomfort or unhappiness, but in a real way, in a fun way, not in a way that, in a way that you can laugh at. Mm -hmm. When you agree to laugh at your own vanity for daring to think that this gig was gonna go the way that you thought it would or that you wanted it to, and you break that ice with a crowd, that's often the first laugh you get. You're going, oh, the crowd are going, oh, great. He's mm. sane. By weird coincidence, one of the few co comedians I've ever seen process pain that he clearly was still in the middle of going through onto stage and turn it into really funny stuff was Brendan Burns. And, oh, and it was, I think, I saw him years ago do that show where he, Brendan v. Burnsy. Hmm. Um, did the mental health one? I can't, yes, prob I mean, aren't they all? But yeah, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, and he came on and shouted as Brendan and he was Burnsy and you kind of went, I said the other way around, he shouted as Burnsy and then he was Brendan and then the second half he went, oh, I really much, I'm, you know, I think I, I much prefer Brendan, he's a friend. <laughs> <laughs> but I also felt like when he was being Brendan, he could go into being Burnsy and it didn't feel like it was a, it was a conflict. It felt like he was more, again, it was, from sanity, you can go into insanity as long. And with, and obviously, w one of the fun things about Brendan is that after, you know, some of the times he's playing off that thing of like, is he really nuts? Is it really safe to laugh? And sometimes it does divide an audience because he hasn't signaled clearly enough, I'm on the right side of this. But having said that, anyway, at the beginning of the of this uh, show, he. Um, he did five minutes of really blistering funny stuff on a breakup that he clearly was days a couple of weeks out of. And I found that impressive. I was like, wow, that's, that's pro I can't imagine what it must be like to be in the middle of that and then make funny jokes out of it and rip the piss out of yourself for feeling it, which is super sane or super sociopathic. It, you know, this is the, the tightrope that, com <laughs> that comedians yeah. are on. Yeah, I, I think I told you in the last interview that comedy is really great therapy for only for people who can't afford a therapist and sure. don't want to get any better. But I think <laughs> that, sure, but I, I but I I don't think I don't think that I don't think that I think what I said about Brendan I think is the exception. I just don't think I, it's always cringeworthy if you feel that people are really working through difficult stuff on stage. It never works for me. And I think you have to be, you can give the appearance of working it through, but then you've brought play into it. Then you've brought the, the element of, you've grounded it with a real emotion, but you're then able to play it and manipulate it a little bit. And then, then it's okay, then I, I can laugh or I can get, then it's drama, then it's fiction. It's no coincidence now that I see, because now I'm connected in this period to levels of the circuit. It's absolutely no coincidence that the, groups of people with the biggest theories and the biggest pseudo knowledge about how to do this are the people who haven't done it or, or the people who are right at the beginning of doing it. And everybody knows after they've done it for two or three years that all that stuff, or, or they've had the right experience, let's say after two or three years or five years, all that stuff gets knocked out of you. And it's just you and what you can do and mostly what you can't <laughs> and how you reconcile yourself to that and enjoy it mm. and accept that and kind of go, I am limited. All right, let's make the best of that then. And there's, you know, there's there's sanity there. Because mm. because uh, a lot of people there, so they'll sort of do maybe a split show to start off mm. with going at Edinburgh, maybe three mm. friends, mm. and then do it maybe with one person, so you mm. do slightly longer. Mm. And then some people do maybe a forty minute thing to fly under the radar, right. which is still a bit sneaky, but I like it. Um, and then there's then people do an hour generally. Generally, that's a common narrative. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm aware that some people's first show tends to be maybe their three twenty minutes to build to an hour mm -hmm. and we I, th I think it was in the last pod but we've definitely spoken off mic about how you said that all th all shows like it, sorry all our shows are a story even if you're not really yeah. telling a story yeah there's a progression of something something thick time has passed <laughs> <laughs> something needs to thicken or the stakes need to get higher the stakes need to some no need to I mean unless you're just incredibly funny all the way through which is, you know, some people are, but even there, you know, people say, you know, reveal or fight, you, more compromising stuff tends to come later in the show as you get to know someone. Or then, you know, I direct, I just did Sean Locke's DVD and, and, and filmed that live show and it was brilliant. And there is a logic, there is a progression of sorts in it, although his, his brilliant logic is within his routines rather than across them. And I, but I don't fully understand the mechanism of that. It was just really entertaining. And there was just so much variety of things that he does inside it. There are so many different areas that he jumps into that I suppose just keeping the difference alive, just doing different things rather is, is entertaining out of his mouth. 
And then he definitely, you know, obviously quite rightly closes on a couple of routines that are really designed to try the audience's patience. And that's quite risky and fun and higher stakes than some of the other stuff that he's done. But yeah, there are some people who defy or I couldn't put a logic, I couldn't put an instant literal, oh, well, that's the story Sean Locke is telling. I, I don't actually know what story he's telling, but I, I know he's telling one because he's definitely moving me and keeping me involved. I'm not bored. Yeah, I think f for me, a lot of shows I go and see, they sort of start with, this is what the show's about. Mm. And then they end with, this is what the show was about. Mm. And then you look at, and if, and if I was to sit down with the script, there'd maybe be 30 minutes in the middle there, which, an, which is nothing to do with either yeah. end of that. Yeah. But it's really good and it's really funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think, I mean, there are some really amazing theme shows I've seen over the years. Yeah. But I think a lot of the time people get too bogged down in, I've got to stick to. Totally. I said, I said the show was about uh, onions. I'm, I'm completely against, so far, I've yet to hear any stand-up that I think should even say, mention the word the show. I don't think that's what stand-up is. I think stand-up is... In the, main, in the main, unless the joke is you're making a show, unless you're discussing it from the point of view of being funny about it, or you're looking at what's messed up about the fact that you're saying that, in which case, say the show, and let's make some jokes. But I think most of it is, this is my life, this is where I'm at, this is what happened to me, I can't get it out of my mind, I'm going to tell you about it. But I think it's direct, direct shared experience is, for me, is the default where stand-up should be. There should be a, a, a l less sense of show or construction around it at all construct the hell out of it just don't tell anybody what you're doing you know it's not don't do the work but don't announce it who cares about some sado in a room that you haven't even paid to get into see talking about his or her show <laughs> oh <Getting> really <laughs> aggressive <laughs> you're doing mad eyes you know? oh never mind i just oh no what i'd had a flat <laughs> no it doesn't matter I, 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 somebody, if this is not connected to what we were talking about, so we don't need to get into it. Okay. But, but, but I'm not into, yeah, I'm not into people talking about shows or what they intended or themes or anything like that. I'm, I'm in favour of getting on with it because that's what you do. You, you work with quite uh, big names. Mm. You, I mean, you, like you said, you've worked with people at pretty much every level of the, mm. of the circuit. And in particular, a, a lot of uh, sort of, like you said, you work in the mainstream, so a lot of household names that, that we won't list off now, but... Uh, pretty much let's put it another way if you've watched most comedy shows or, or you know you've been given a DVD in the last couple of years most likely you've either worked with them or have had some sort of connection it's possible with them. Yeah, maybe, yeah maybe half of them I don't know yeah, yeah some sort of connection sure do you because you're not your, your name doesn't quite have the same impact in that <laughs> I'm trying to find a nice yeah, way not, of asking not quite you're right yeah. not quite though no no, no. I, mean, I think it could look good on a DVD don't get me sure. wrong but I'm wondering well, maybe a Netflix special let's do it that way but I'm wondering whether you ever get or whether there's a frustration in the your your peers on the thing the people you're working with no um, they're not my I mean not my peers I mean most of the I, I definitely the older I get obviously the clearer I'm about what I can do no I don't care about any of that because I because pretty much within reason my choices have been more or less my own and certainly in terms of comedy and my mistakes have been my own and my there are definitely things I could have handled and could handle better around performing that might have pushed me further but ultimately, if I'm really honest about it, I don't know that I value those things. I don't know that that's what I really wanted. So I've got no issue with that at all. I th and I also think that most people who have a name and a proper income and some recognition in this game, I think most of them deserve, deserve to be there because they can do it at a good enough level, at a high enough level. There are people who are not famous who can do it at that level. Not many, though. You know, I... Obviously, we understand that this business is increasingly prone in the last 20 years, 25 years to fashion, to sort of trends in other aspects of youth culture and marketing and so on and so forth. It is, it is not just about how funny you are. It's about how cute and funny you are or how, much, or how demographically appealing and marketable and funny you are. The reason, the reason I was bringing that up is uh, you're sort of moving, well, you're on a hiatus, as it were, from stand-up. I think, I think that's probably the best way of saying it because like you said, you're on and off with it whenever you're interested. I haven't done it for about a year. Yeah. Um, and that's so you can focus on uh, other things, but also in, in particular your film. That you pers yeah, some personal life has definitely push, pulled me this way. Yeah. But yeah, but it's basically so I can make this film that I've been going on about for too long. Yeah. And 
we were talking about uh, the the additional work that goes in behind the scenes of a film because obviously it's it's similar but it's it's a ninety minute structured narrative rather than a sixty. Um, there's a the finance issue that you closer of, to two hours this one. But oh, yeah, sorry, sure. right. <laughs> well, I was I was going to ask meal. I was going to ask whether and this is and I, I hope this isn't going to come off cynical as or as weird as it might do, but. If you were, if you had a bigger name or you had a bigger pull factor, do you think you would have got an opportunity to do a film sooner because of? Oh no, 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 no. Because because the kind of films that I want to do is it's not. I mean, I need a big, I need a bigger name than me to be in the film <laughs> in order in order that I can raise the small amount of money I need to make it. Um, but no, my my inability to direct and write a film up until this point in my life has simply been down to my inability to have enough emotional and psychological maturity and will and connection to be able to do it as a person and the intelligence and the drive to do it. Um, I just, you know, I'm, I'm a phenomenally late developer. I've got flashes of goodness, but you know, it's, you know, all the pe the pieces d haven't really settled for me until they're being in my forties, you know, and I'm no longer in my forties, <laughs> but that's when things started to sort of settle and become a little less uh, intimidating or problematic to me. Um, so, uh, so no, the reasons I haven't made a film now, nah, it's uh, like the, all that stuff that you mentioning in terms of, you know, how do I feel about not being a big name or anything like that? Or how do I feel about being around big names? Those, things would have been an issue for me 20 years ago when they mattered to me, but they don't matter. It matters to me to, to have a name in what I do, but it matters more to me to be able to do that in in a way that I can respect and live with. And for me, that's making a film or I'm making films. I'm writing another one. And the uh, assumption of the uh, you know rest of my professional life is I'm going to be doing this now and I'd love to do stand-up as and when I feel confident and wanting to do something with it and have the space in my life to do it but this seems to me like a better use of my talents and abilities and certainly I'm a better director than I'm a stand-up no question I can bring more of myself to it I'm able to think much more fluidly around you know all sorts of problems it's just I'm comfortable there mm. And, and this was in the last pod, but we were talking about uh, how you feel more comfortable doing a narrative over sort of 90 minutes to two hours than an hour. Well, I don't know. I mean, because I haven't had enough experience of that. But I certainly feel that the what I'm really interested in and what I love, I mean, I haven't done this, so we'll see. I've, I've only written a couple of things of that length. But we'll see whether I can hold an audience, especially, you know, once you get 100 minutes in. It's that... It, but there's definitely a thing. It's the awkward forty minute mark in an Edinburgh. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That it, it it's it's actually the yeah, that <laughs> but it's actually what I find interesting is and it's where I do find things like Edinburgh hours less satisfying or substantial. I don't really think you really can create really good arcs over an hour. Like the show a show I did with Mark Steele a couple of years ago where which had a real narrative arc where he was tracing his genealogy and his and had discovered his who his true parents were even that ran bloody an hour and 25 you know i feel the two the actually the the three good shows that i've done in edinburgh i mean i've just about crammed one of them into one hour 10 but they're all 80 minute shows like to to arc in a in a in a in a satisfying way and bring the balls down so if what i like is i like and there's no equivalence for it in the quote-unquote edinburgh hour i like the feeling you get when you're 85 minutes into something and it's not over and the balls are coming down in a certain way or things are wrenching in a certain way and there's just a cumulative time spent at the coalface just with the thing inside the thing that that's to me is a more enjoyable and and rich and meaningful experience than being 50 minutes into a stand-up show that's about to come down um yes i like i just personally like that other thing i think you can do i think as a viewer, I enjoy that more. I think more can be done in that space. And that's what I obviously plan to do as a, a, a maker of those things. Whether I do or not, we'll see. But. Do, you, do you find, uh, and correct me if I'm 
saying this wrong as, as you, how you actually feel about it. Do you find as your interest, as you put it, in stand-up declines, your interest in directing increases? Or, or is it that they both go together? And it's no, my, my, I mean, no, my interest in directing and storytelling is, it increases. But weirdly, no, the only thing that declines is my interest in doing stand-up. I don't feel the necessity to be the person effectively limiting quite a good brain uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, that has always been my problem has been to do with my limitations as an individual performer, um, that I have better ideas. And I think my ideas and my shows are better than me in, in terms of, you know, what I deliver. That's, you know, well, I don't know how much self-hatred there is in with that. And I don't, and I don't care, to be honest. Um, I've made my decision. I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> um, but the, the truth of it is that my, my interest in directing and storytelling has increased, but also my interest in stand-up itself has increased. I find, weirdly, by the fact that I don't have to sully these pure thoughts by having to do it and face my own failure inside it, um, I actually really connect with the purity of stand-up at the moment. I really And I really love finding funny things in people, and I'm surprised, given how into story I am and into context I am, that... I keep pushing people to be funnier and going, this ain't funny enough. We've got to make this funny. And, but for me, the way of getting it funny is to kind of, let's go a bit deeper. Let's kind of find out what's fucking, come on. Let's get you out of your box a bit. Let's get you on the back foot. Let's see what's going on. Let's have some fun. So, but it, it is all in service of telling this bigger meta story, this bigger story about this spirit that doesn't belong on stage yet is somehow on stage entertaining people in their sort of pathetic way. And just the glorious vulnerable sadness of a clown and the tragedy of it yeah all of that is but to me that's all about to me that's like in most of the time being funnier is to tell a better story you know because where are you going for your laugh what are you making me laughing at you've got to be revealing new depths of yourself new insanities in your thought process new ways of you know ridiculizing yourself and being foolish and also, you know, being truthful, slagging things off that need to be properly slagged off and identified and said for me in better language than I can think of. That's what I want. My, so that's all good storytelling to me anyway. Yeah, I, as, and I think, I mean, I've seen comedians do really good 20 minute club sets with stories. Most of the time I don't see that. Most of the time no. I see it as just a load of jokes. It's not about that. It should be a load of jokes. We, it should feel like a load of jokes. Yeah. Which is fine because that's literally what you're being. You don't to want you don't in stand up. You really need to have a really good excuse if you're going to stop and tell people about something that happened to you like a while ago. You really do. You can. I. I really feel like you can say I'm really. I'm really self absorbed. Blah blah blah. I'll tell you when I was five. I was fine. You, you, that's fine because you've told me that you've got this problem and you've cut back to when you were five in order to illustrate what your current problem is. That to me speaking I mean a bit crudely that's very knee-jerk now now by all means show me 10 examples of why I'm wrong but that to me is what keeps it current that you're there is a working through going on there is an ostensible problem piece of problem solving happening on stage and the comedian comes up with a problem that they have in life and then they either go into it and look into it which can lead to jokes or in a serious way and deal with a problem or they answer it in a stupid way and become a child and, you know, whatever that is. But, you you know, punchlines are responses to the problems set up by premises. So, yeah, to me, it's so therefore, um, that for me is why it lends itself to present tense talking through. This is what happened now. This is what I'm just thinking. This came up the top of my head. It should feel spontaneous. It should not feel written. It should feel unmediated. It should, you know, all of that stuff which is why it breaks people's hearts when they realise there's a director. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's... Well, I don't break people's heart. Nobody cares. Well, I, uh, well, no, I've, Nobody's I've, even asking that question about comedians. This yeah, is but a, <laughs> I think that's a, it's, a, it's a decent thing to get into about why... Because I I, I, when I told people that I was doing this, I'm doing the... the it will have happened by now, but the um, de day of panels and stuff. When I said oh, I was yeah. having the directors on about that... Most people's questions were like, but like, you know, how many people really use directors? Why would you use directors? This is going to be like your creative expression of yourself and your hour and stuff. And I go, yes. Could you not express yourself better by, for example, you know, like when you have a problem, you talk to your mates about it and they give you an outsider point of view and kind of try and uh, mm -hmm. guide you into being a little bit less 
uh, emotive and a bit more kind of rational in what you're thinking about something that's pissed you off for it example. could be but that's not show advice that's life advice yeah, as long you know as you can mean, react, but, but in a sense yes yeah. yes I agree it's a similar thing where you've got someone there to yeah. bounce the idea off of to make yeah. it funnier and exactly. to make it work yeah um, and, and to me that makes sense mm. and it would and it makes sense why a lot of people might need it but I suppose my my, my sort of very close to the end question would be uh, do you ever have someone where you go you just don't need a director oh yeah like you um, who, what kind of person would that be what who was of- I speaking to you and I saw someone yesterday yeah I mean uh, well most of your it depends what people want to do I think most stand-ups who are successful and doing well don't need a director in the sense that they need that they need anyone to help them be funnier or Define find their voice, voice yeah. or even articulate their process the way they write jokes. Normally, that's up and running and pretty good. I'm working with someone at the moment who's a household name, and their show simply needs uh, script editing. It needs reshaping and it needs slightly repointing in terms of being clear about what the show is really about and from where is all, is all this stuff coming and a lot of the advice that I sort of tend to give is actually funneling into here and bringing this person to kind of go no 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 be this L- let you feel let us know what you feel more that's where the fun is you caught in this situation it's what's funny just let that let it go let yourself go crazy but enjoy it we'll laugh at you and but they don't need a director in terms of you know finding who they are shows need directors Having said that, this is not a conversation I would force on this person because it's up to the client what they want to do. And this is not my work. I'm not the author. However, I, I do actually really think, I think I know who this person, I think I know what this person should now be talking about in their next show. And I think it's how it would develop them and make them a better comedian. I think it might lose them a chunk of their audience though. And this is the. But would it gain them a new chunk of an audience? Possibly, yes. Possibly, and I yeah. and I certainly think as as careers sort of get longer and you know the audience ages with you, I do think you know some reinvention depends what kind of act you are, but this act could take it actually. Some reinvention. It's not about disobeying why you're funny or your rhythm or mm. your style. That's that is what it is. But your agenda, where you're going for your laughs. You know, this is the real fun thing. You know, when you've got someone who's a really accessible, funny person who's got the bones for it and those people then start to deepen and go okay I'm going to bring these every every person skills universal skills I'm going to sort of bring them to stuff that's a little bit more personal that's quite exciting because it even though I suspect you know some of that might lose you the audience what's interesting is is the accessibility what's interesting is you know you want to we understand that you can't please all the people all the time, but you want to be able to bring everybody. There's, there's, there's no inherent reason why everyone in the audience shouldn't like almost all of the comedians that are on, that are around, if they're any good, because you're just communicating yourself to them. You're just bringing them to you. There's no... Yeah, I don't know. I've slightly lost my... Excuse me. Oh, my, I might ask for the last part of that to be edited out. <laughs> That's all right. We can, we can talk about that again. Sure. Round three. <laughs> No, we will never Third do this time. again. Third time? <laughs> um, well, the, the last question was going to be if you if you had one bit of advice for someone who was interested in working with a director but wasn't sure where to start or even finding one, let alone, you know, what to do. Well, what would you... Finding ha- them is not hard. You just ask your colleagues on the comedy circuit who they've worked with or who's around. I think unless you're specifically involved with directing a show and staging it or thinking about how things are going to manifest and really come out on stage. I think a lot of this work, because so much of it is development, I would call it, it's creative production. You're producing a person, you're helping a person understand both themselves and their parameters as an act, and also or what their kind of agendas could be. What, you know, you, you look, you're looking for stuff to feed the persona, and then can you make that interesting? How can you, you know, obviously. I mean, do you have collaborators in your life? Do you have, are you asking questions of what you're doing? Are you able to challenge yourself and move yourself on or try different things? Are you comfortable in that groove? And if you're able to do that on your own, you probably don't need a director. You know, if you're able to ask yourself those questions. But, you know, if not, or or you don't know, or you feel there's something else there, or you feel you're not getting somewhere in your work, then maybe you need to speak to someone in the same... Yeah, Come same. see the doctor. Well, <laughs> is, is it, you know, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> see if there's anything there. 
and with me you get i mean it's a very particular opinion i you know if you any number of people would give different views and wouldn't you know try and pass this off as as um definitive but um but yeah it's about asking questions of your process and it's about getting to know yourself and it's about in a creative sense and it's often about allowing more into evidence you know than you would have originally allowed it's about going it's about someone going you know that thing you do that's pretty funny that thing you do that just grow that a little bit. Do you get laughs in life when you do that with people? Do people enjoy that? Do you have any fun with that? Just do a little bit of that. Are you having fun doing that? Let's, let's see if we can feed that. Go out now and over the next few days, just see if you feel like that and if there are any lines come to you. Whatever, just finding elements of a personality that you can just kind of grow and play with and, and see if it works. And then you put it on stage and people enjoy it. Or you put it on stage and it doesn't work. Or, you know, it just felt good that day. That's okay. That's all process. But it's about... But it's about trying to get people to just ask questions of themselves without those questions being crippling it's like you're you know you really are allowed to fail most of it is going to be blind alleys and dead ends so deal with it and making you know uh, you know what i've answered it I, I'm, I'm i've answered it i'm, I'm bored i was bored, bored with myself as i was no because i really did enjoy kind of writing down earlier going oh i, I did think this about this but I, don't, I think <laughs> so. I'm just listening to it. I'm just listening to the voice in my head where people are probably listening to it going. Oh, we're not. Everybody. You think he's bored? <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. um, I think that's fine. Yeah, I, I, think, I, love the, I love the way like you just directed this whole episode. <laughs> you just sort of go, Ask me this. Do that. Do this. I've got some notes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was John. I loved talking to him about so many things but I think my favorite part of it was hearing him talk about the why hearing somebody else because uh, I, I, I meet people all the time who are interested in like what you're doing they always say what are you up to what is going on and for me it's always why are you doing that what is driving you to do that what's again that's a what there isn't it um, but the, the, the why you're doing the what is the most interesting thing for me because then you can really dig deep and get something funny out of it or interesting out of it or get to know and connect with that person. So I found that really interesting to talk to him about. Um, I also loved his take on him just being a glorified script editor and his his collaborative process and the way that he doesn't really care what venue you're doing it in or where you're taking it it's all about trying to express ideas and for me that's just that was really exciting and resonated a lot with me and and as he mentioned in the podcast it's the second time we've spoken and so we've sort of spent a collective amount of time together probably mounting into five or six hours and um this was just fun to put together with with a lot of his help a lot of his directoral notes so um i hope you enjoyed it i hope you got a lot out of it if you did like this episode and you want to talk to john about maybe him directing some of your work there'll be a link in the show notes for some of his upcoming quote unquote doctor sessions at angel comedy at the bill murray so if you would like to book those i highly recommend them i've done one um I did a two-hour session with him and it was really exciting and interesting and it really gave me a push to work harder on this year's Edinburgh show, which I've just been confirmed for. So if you're interested in coming to see my show, it currently doesn't have a title, but it will be at Sweet Venues uh, in the Grass Market. It'll be at the Novotel just around the corner from the Grass Market. I'm very excited. It's a new venue. It's a box space for me to do a theatre. Uh, it's sort of a theatre-infused stand-up show. I'm really excited about it. Uh, I have a meeting this week with a lighting person. A lighting person? I don't know what their job title is, but they're going to help me out with the lighting cues and things. Um, it's going to be really, really good. Uh, yeah, so anyway, off topic, Simon. Keep your eye out for that because I am coming around the country doing previews of that. If you'd like me to come and do a preview where you live, uh, I'm doing a living room tour. So please do feel free to tweet me at this made me cool or email me simon.m.kane at gmail.com and I will most likely come and do it if you can get 15 or more friends into the room so just drop me a line and if you want to negotiate where and how and what just uh, and why and why of course don't forget the why uh, just message me and we'll talk about it if you're a promoter or you're a comedian and you're putting on stuff at your local club or your local venue whatever it would be just give me a message i would love to book in some more previews of this and uh honestly at the moment i'm not doing tech run-through previews so don't feel like 
oh, my living room doesn't have a lighting rig. That's not a problem. I'm doing run throughs of jokes in living rooms, so you don't have to worry too much about that. But do send me a message. Um, oh, I want to quickly just plug some other episodes that you might like if you like this episode, actually, because I feel like it's a good idea to recommend some others. If you like this episode, uh, I'd check out Milton Jones. We discussed his uh, writing process, how he's written books and tours, and how he's developed shows, as well as Jonathan Pye, and how he collaborates with Andrew Doyle, and how that's impacted on the character, and how that helped grow the character and grow the ecosystem around Jonathan Pye which is the, the satirical comedy creation that he plays I would have a look back just to go back through some of the episodes we have 99 episodes guys there must be other episodes you'd be interested in so go and give yourself a download uh, and please do support the show if you're new here please do hit the subscribe button if you're old here please do remember to give me an honest ideally positive review in iTunes and if you can please do give me a donation we're at episode 99 now if you've still never ever given a donation and you've even enjoyed five episodes episodes chuck a five on my way please it's um it would be massively helpful genuinely i i don't really want to go into the costs and how hard this show is to put together and the amount of time and effort that goes into it with this one in particular we had to we re-recorded it twice which has obviously taken up more time than normal so uh, honestly if you can afford to help me and chuck me a quid or even become a patron and donate from one dollar which is 80p per episode even for a few months that would be really helpful and really appreciated so if you like this and you value this and you want it to go forward please do also if you're going to become a patron remember this if you give more than a fiver you can get a free copy of my book a digital copy of that and also you will get three copies of the leg up day the Edinburgh Fringe thing that we did the other day which, which was with a load of venues from the Edinburgh Festival a load of PRs and a load of people who do show production including John himself so if you want more John content John content? John John Kent or what? I can't speak right now if you want more content from John please become a patron and you will be given it as part of your patronage that would be amazing the Ask the Industry podcast is a fruit that got in gravity's way production for the internet all elements were created by me comedian Simon Kane. thank you very much for listening thank you very much for subscribing and thank Thank you very much for rating and donating if you do. I'll see you all in about 14 days time. Bye.